Thank you. And I want to say thank you to everyone for being here tonight. Um, I am excited to see this many people in this room, but I am not at all surprised. As a few people have already alluded to, as New Yorkers, you are very familiar with the impact that climate has on every aspect of our lives. And you are especially familiar with the changes that are affecting our climate, that those changes are having on your, your energy, uh, through infrastructure issues, through flooding, through storm surges, through power outages, um, and the havoc that that can wreak um, when climate change impacts your community in a very personal way. The good news is, is that there are people just like you meeting in other churches tonight, in community centers, uh, in basement uh, rooms, uh, all over the country and all over the world to talk about the impacts of climate change and to figure out how it is that they can make an impact. And so this is probably one of many things that you're doing in your life to examine what are the areas where I can have an impact. You've probably already had an energy efficiency audit at your home or at your apartment. You're probably talking to your state representatives and your city councilors about what it is that your state and your city can do to make sure that they're passing laws and regulations that help to protect the climate and advance clean energies. Um, and you're probably doing other things, like trying to reduce your food waste and trying to reduce your water use. So you come to 350.org as one of the organizations that you work with to get information and advice and strategies for how you can change your behavior to impact the climate in a positive way. And at Ceres, we really believe that markets should not be divorced from the climate, they should not be divorced from the environment, and they should not be divorced from social issues. And so since around 1989, uh, shortly after actually the Exxon Valdez oil spill, a group of folks got together and created what was initially known as the Coalition for Environmentally Responsible Economic Systems. And they really wanted to look at providing resources to investors and to companies and to policymakers to help them figure out how to move markets to integrate environmental and social risks into the markets so that we have fewer and fewer of the externalities uh, that City Councilor Rosenthal was talking about. And so Ceres, formed in 1989, is really dedicated to mobilizing investors and companies to move markets towards climate action, water action, uh, environmental action, and social justice actions. And over the course of the time that Ceres has been working, uh, we have developed a particular expertise in climate change and climate issues. And in 2001 and 2002, as part of our work with investors, including um, in particular the Connecticut uh, State Pension Fund, a group came together and an idea was formed to create something called the Investor Network on Climate Risk. And so the first Investor Network on Climate Risk was actually held here in New York City in 2002 at the United Nations. And now that movement has grown to over 110 investors who represent over $13 trillion in assets who are taking action every day in integrating climate change issues and environmental and social issues into the investment plans and strategies that they advance. And so that's a, a huge step forward and that's been something that Ceres has carefully stewarded uh, and worked with investors to create and develop. And as a part of that, we also work together with investors around the world to create something called the Global Investor Coalition. And now we work with hundreds of investors in Europe, in Asia, in Australia, all over the world to ensure that investors are getting the same types of tools and information that you're getting as you try to change your lives to combat climate change. So a couple of the things that have recently come together at Ceres uh, have grown out of the Investor Network on Climate Risk. And one of those pieces 
is something called the Carbon Asset Risk Initiative. And Ceres worked very closely with the Carbon Tracker Initiative uh, in 2012 and in 2013 to look at this issue that we really saw arising around the issue of the carbon bubble and the carbon budget. And the carbon budget, as everyone has talked about, is, is this really important concept that I wish someone had come up with sooner. Um, but I think that it really was developed at a perfect time. Because in 2011, when the Carbon Tracker report, the first report on unburnable carbon came out, people were st still very much had in mind the impacts from the 2008 financial crisis and meltdown. And this idea that there were these assets out there that were improperly valued, but that people didn't have the information to determine what the, the actual value of those assets should be, um, was an idea whose time had really come, and an idea that really galvanized investors and advocates around the country and around the world to focus on this question of how to prevent fossil fuel companies from wasting billions of dollars worth of capital by investing in high cost projects that were only profitable at the high price levels that we were seeing of $105 and $110 a barrel. When we knew that in order to maintain a livable climate, we needed to keep at least two thirds of those fossil fuel reserves in the ground. And so that report in particular, and Bill McKibben's efforts to really publicize the math behind that report, um, was something that kicked off and met a need that a lot of investors had felt, but hadn't really been able to articulate in a viable way up until that point. And so working together with the Carbon Tracker Initiative and with our investors, we developed a set of letters geared towards some of the most fossil fuel intensive companies who were planning to spend almost a trillion dollars worth of capital expenditures on digging up Arctic reserves, oil sand reserves, deep water reserves, and other reserves that really needed to be left underground. And in September of 2013, over 75 institutional investors representing over $4 trillion sent those letters out to Exxon, to Chevron, to ConocoPhillips, to PetroChina, to Gazprom, um, to Duke Energy. So they sent those letters out and they called attention to this issue that investors really cared about and really wanted to have an impact on. And they asked each of these companies to assess their vulnerability to stranded assets or wasted capital as a result of a few factors that Carbon Tracker identified and that people at Ceres and other investors were starting to be very concerned about. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit, a bit about these specific factors. One of those factors was something that we referred to in the letter as the capital expenditure crisis. And there's a great um, resource out there for folks. It's uh, a group called Kepler Shivro, who is uh, an analyst out of the UK and they've done some, some really incredible analysis on this. And they have talked about something called the capital expenditure crisis. And what they did was they took a look at the capital expenditures that were being spent by fossil fuel companies from 2000 to 2013, particularly with the focus on oil and gas companies. And what they saw is that the curve on those capex expenditures was going up at a very steep level. And that was really kind of mirroring the prices of oil going up at the same time. And so, in some respects, the fact that they were spending more capital to find and dig up and produce and transfer, transfer and refine these products only cut into their margins slightly. But it assumed, and their capital planning processes assumed, that that price of oil would remain stable. And at the same time as we saw at least a 100% increase in spending, capital expenditures, to produce oil, there was only about a 3% rise in production growth. So think about that for a minute. 
You're spending over 100% more than you were spending, and yet you're only getting a 3% growth in the amount of oil that you're producing. Under the $107 a barrel scenario, companies were still making money. What the letter asked them to do was consider stress testing their portfolios to find out what would happen if either price or demand shifted. So stress test your portfolios for lower prices of oil, $60 a barrel oil, $70 a barrel oil, $90 a barrel oil. The other issue that we pointed out in the letter was that it's not just about how much capital expenditures have increased, but that there are other trends at play that affect prices. And those include, in particular, demand for oil and natural gas. And as a lot of folks have pointed out, the costs of alternative energies, of wind, of solar, and now battery storage, have been going down on a rapid pace. And the oil companies have not been updating their forecasts to account for the amazing progress that's been made in providing cheaper solar panels and cheaper wind farms and cheaper batteries. So we asked them to test their portfolios for what would happen if there were changes to demand because of that trend. And then the other thing that we asked them to take a look at was the physical risks that they were facing as they were going after these unconventional resources in places like the Arctic, in deep water uh, areas of the Gulf of Mexico or off of Africa. What were the physical risks that they were taking on by going after these unconventional resources? And we also asked the companies to stress test their portfolios specifically against the IEA's scenario for maintaining global warming at no less than a two degrees Celsius temperature rise. So that was really the beginning of the Carbon Asset Risk Initiative at Ceres. And it brought in investors, including the New York um, City Comptroller, as well as the New York State um, Pension Funds. Uh, it brought in investors from the UK and from Australia and, and all across the world to reach out to these companies and really, for the first time, try to engage them specifically on this issue of limiting their capital expenditures in fossil fuels. So that's one side of the coin. At the same time, Ceres was moving forward with an idea that was really catalyzed by a statement by the IEA that talked about the types of investments that we would need by 2050 in order to get to a clean energy system worldwide. And one of the IEA studies said that we need to invest about $44 trillion in clean energy between now and 2050 in order to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. And Ceres looked at that and they said, you know, that's a little over a trillion a year for the next 35 years. So they created something called the Clean Trillion Campaign. And that's an effort that's really aimed not only towards investors, but also towards the companies that Ceres works with to get them to invest more capital in clean energy. And earlier this year, Ceres had a joint announcement with Citi about an investment that they were going to create of $100 billion a year in an environmental finance program. And they've also been working, our corporate group has also been working with companies like J.P. Morgan and companies like Bank of America who've made commitments of $50 million for environmental finance programs and that type of thing. The corporate program has also been working with companies that are non-fossil fuel companies to get them to green their supply chains by investing in clean energy. And that's part of the clean trillion too. Getting, for example, the commitment from Apple to source all of their energy from renewable energy was one of the commitments that our corporate team also brought in this year. And so that's another piece of combating the, the continued spending of capital on fossil fuels is getting to the demand side, not just focused on the supply side, but getting to the demand and decreasing the demand for the fossil fuels that the companies continue to burn and, and exploit. Um, so we've really got these two tracks that are advancing at the same time. 
And so while we're moving forward with sending out the letters to the companies, we were also working with groups like Apple and others to increase their investments on the clean side. Now, a lot of people have asked, you know, what are, how are you ever going to make any inroads with fossil fuel companies? And I don't want anyone to think that I have visions of turning ExxonMobil into a solar company. Um, <laughs> I, I don't have visions of that. I'm not sure that I would like for them to be involved in solar. Uh, I'm not sure what the, the outcomes of that would be. But that doesn't mean that there are not opportunities to influence fossil fuel companies to limit capital expenditures on the most damaging reserves that they've been going after, and also to think about how to shift their business models so that they can survive in the economy that we envision. And so, just to talk a little bit about some of the changes that have occurred since that campaign was launched back in 2013. On the one hand, you've seen this incredible effort that was made by the New York City Comptroller's Office of filing resolutions at 33 separate oil, gas, coal, and electric utilities and sending, making sure that they had good representatives at each of those um, annual meetings to, to speak up on behalf of that shareholder resolution and to garner large votes in favor of proxy access. And you saw, in fact, a lot of people have probably heard about um, the Shell and BP resolutions. How, how many folks heard about the Shell and BP climate resolutions that were, that were passed uh, earlier this year? A few folks. So there was a lot of press about this when it happened. In, in the UK, uh, over 50 investors filed with BP and with Shell and asked the companies to test their portfolios to a two degree scenario. And the companies actually came out in support of those resolutions. And they passed at BP by 98.3% vote and at Shell by a 99% vote. But what you haven't perhaps heard as much press about is the fact that Apache Energy Corp was one of the companies that the New York City Comptroller filed a proxy access resolution with. And Apache actually came out in support of that resolution and it got a 90% vote. That's much more in terms of shareholder support for climate resolutions than we have ever seen um, in the past. And just to hit home the point of why it's important to have engagement on the issue of board govern governance. So ConocoPhillips was one of the companies that we sent the initial letter out to on the Carbon Asset Risk Initiative. And ConocoPhillips actually does have a little bit of board expertise on climate and the environment. Jody Freeman, who is a Harvard Law School professor and was a member of the Obama administration's energy team, is on the board of directors of ConocoPhillips. And since the engagements have begun with ConocoPhillips around this issue of carbon asset risk, ConocoPhillips has actually come out with a new set of forecasting that they're doing to test their portfolio and to inform their capital planning. And three out of the four scenarios that they're using to test their investments are now consistent with the two degree scenario that's laid out by the IEA. That's a huge shift. And it's one that no other company has made to this point to come out with a public forecast that includes three out of four scenarios that get you to the two degree scenario. Statoil is also one of the companies who got the initial letter and has been uh, very actively engaged by shareholders over the past year and a half. And Statoil now in their energy forecasts is predicting that economic growth will slow in any scenario that doesn't meet the two degree target. That's also a huge change. Now they're starting to actually say, we can't project and make our capital planning decisions on the basis that economic growth is just going to steadily rise and with it demand for oil will rise because we're now going to include in our forecasts the damages, the economic damages that will be wrought for countries and, and people and companies by a higher than two degree scenario. So that's, that's a big change that's happening. Um, we're also working with investors 
not only to engage with these companies, but to engage with the SEC, as the New York City Comptroller's Office has. In 2010, the SEC, after being petitioned by Ceres, New York City, I believe, was one of the initial petitioners on this 2007 petition to the SEC, um, agreed to issue guidance on climate disclosures and the need for companies to disclose risks due to climate if they pose material risks. And so again, we're starting to engage with the SEC. There are a variety of ways to engage. And one of the things that Ceres does is try to provide a complete toolbox. So in fact, there are investors that we work with who've begun to look at different types of divestment uh, metrics for their portfolios as well. And so they'll look at, you know, as some of the pension funds have done, coal companies that get more than 30% of their revenues or more than 50% of their revenues from thermal coal, they'll look at divesting from those companies. I think the, the primary issue here is that there are a lot of strategies. Just like you're deploying a lot of strategies in your individual life to see how you can affect climate change and interact with your state, with the companies that you invest in, with your energy company, um, investors also are starting to do that. And one of our primary goals is to provide them with a full set of tools and blueprints for being able to make those changes that will have an impact on climate. So I'll, I'll end there so that we can uh, have time for our next speaker. Thanks.